<laughs> hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Agent Boost podcast. If you've been listening to a few episodes, I've got a nice raspy voice today. Uh, so we got a couple of cool, uh, interesting, well, I don't know if they're cool, but we have some significant uh, industry updates or things going on that are kind of causing some chaos that we wanted to kind of talk about real quick and address. Uh, first of which kind of being the recent hack of the uh, that affected Medicaid eligibility and prescription drug benefits from UHC's change health. Change health, yep. Yep. And so I think that's that's a big thing. So for the brokers who are out there selling a lot, it's easy to verify, you know, extra help. You know, sometimes most of the portals, they, they work great as far as Medicare eligibility. I think that's not a problem. Usually most carriers now, their, their tech is great in their portal where you can verify and see okay, do they have Medicare Part A and B? It's the actual Medicaid eligibility that is very challenging. And there's a lot of different services out there. Like we talk about it, there's, you know, YPRO is out there. They're a vendor for that. Change Health being the the biggest and Laser being another. But those are like the three big um, companies out there that do Medicaid eligibility. Yeah, so, so Change is actually, they're rebranding even right now to Optum. They got acquired. They're owned by Optum, so essentially United Healthcare, and that's the cause or the source of this interesting breach. And well, but, but to provide perspective, though, and to that, is because that that is like the back end source. Like they're actually like the the system, you know, Change Health that you did Optum acquired. Um, that's actually that tool or integration that's doing that um, Medicaid eligibility lookup, and that's what kind of plugs in or powers the portals a lot of these other carriers use. That's that back end that's when you're logging into these carrier portals, it's doing that. Yeah, correct. So because, and maybe some of you know this if you sell in, in multiple states, but state Medicaids are obviously just that. They're ran by the state governments, the state entities, and each state has their own different system, their own eligibility, their own criteria. There's not really a federal standardized system that everybody uses for Medicaid eligibility. So Change essentially had built a platform that aggregates all of these different Medicaid eligibility systems into one platform, and they were able to essentially ping the state repositories and Correct. verify the eligibility. So it is basically the only thing in the in the country that does all the Medicaid a- a- aggregation. So it almost kind of the hack and the sent everything back in the Stone Ages a few years before we used to have, before uh, we had these digital eligibility tools. So now we're seeing carriers are having to call over. Used to have to, you know, verify someone's eligibility. If you had their number, used to have to call Martha or Mary at the at the state exchange and verify what level of LIS or some, Medicaid they Some were brokers on. listening to this right now are like, oh my gosh, yes, I hated those days. I would sit on hold for 30 minutes waiting to hear if this person had this eligibility level. Yeah, so... so we're basically back dealing with that right now. The other thing that happened was it affected the ability for a lot of PBMs or pharmacies to bill the insurance because that's one of the prime uh, functions of this change healthcare system uh, is that you essentially are a biller on the, on the billing side. It aggregates all these different insurers and the providers. We have a, a change account as well uh, where you're able to aggregate and check the eligibility of all these different insurance. So if you're an insurance provider, you know, you're a, one of these billing gals at the front desk and you have your insurance. It, there's a lot of different possibilities, co-payments. Uh, it's hard to know what they are. This system kind of aggregates them as well as the state Medicaid systems. And so it just gives a real time lookup of what correct. their actual cost sharing is. Right. Yep. And so these carriers, <laughs> these providers can add the insurers that they work with and then do like a ping post, you know, verify it. And so with this hack and this breach, it also made it so a lot of pharmacies weren't able to bill. So people are not getting their medications because they're showing up to the pharmacies and people are saying, oh, hey, well, we can't bill this. We don't know what insurance you have or they're having to pay cash prices for it or whatnot. Mm -hmm. So it's actually causing quite a bit of of turmoil. And for us, we've seen it, um, you know, we're seeing on our virtual teams resulting in about a 20% decrease in our sales already this week. Just because there's that uncertainty that well, they're let's, not able to verify it. Yeah, well, let's talk about the why, though, because it's become more sophisticated over the years. We talk about the, the digital ability. There's um, And there's also things called BEQ files, which we can talk about in another podcast. But um, essentially what happens is 
all these plans, these carriers have a very diverse portfolio now. So they'll have a traditional MAPD plan, whether it be an HMO or a PPO. Then they'll have their partial dual plan, their full dual plan, and chronic plans. And so for the broker, and going back to Medicaid eligibility levels, what they call the eligibility levels, like vary from state to state. And so like the, the common things being like Slim B's, SLM B's, Quim B, Quim B plus full dual. Um, but depending on the state that you're in too, you can qualify for a full dual plan on different eligibility levels, depending on the state. So like Correct. one state may say, Hey, we'll take everything that's Slim B or better. And another state's like, no, we're only Quim B plus or whatever that may be. And so the, the criteria is different. And so for the brokers, they're going, hmm, now I can't verify. I don't know what level you have. I know this person is, you know, not in a great financial place. I know they get extra help, but I don't know their level. So now I don't know what plan I should put them on. So we're seeing some hesitancy of the brokers not wanting to screw up and put them on a wrong plan. They don't want to misquote and say the wrong benefits and get a CTM or a complaint. And then the other thing, of course, that we're already thinking is we're going to see more RFIs because... Yes people are kind of just having to guess what plan they think people are on or what kind of eligibility level. And we just know that we're going to see a lot more RFIs in the next 30 days. Yeah. If you're new, an RFI is request for information. It's essentially a pended app that needs some sort of additional clarification so they weren't able to automatically process it. Yeah. And we so. actually, so we aggregate RFIs every month and we send it out to the agent like real time. So like every single week we actually aggregate the RFIs from all of our carriers and we send that report out to every one of our agents. And then whoever is responsible to manage that agent, whether it be an MGA and your field agent or whether that be on one of our internal teams, we also let their kind of manager, whoever is responsible for overseeing that agent, we let them know as well. And some of the examples of the RFI is, let's say an agent put a partial dual person on a full dual plan. Well, that's going to be pended because they can't verify the eligibility level. Um, the other things that we see in RFIs are, you know, um, data is incorrect on the MBI. Like some carriers, like I will say United Healthcare, they're excellent. Like if you submit an application, whether it be lean, paper, whatever, if you screw up a digit in the MBI, they automatically get that. They correct it. They're yeah, you don't even hear fixes. from it, hear about it. They just solve it and fix your app for you. Other carriers are like, oh, I can't tell if that's an I or a T. We're just going to reject it. And they will just reject it without doing any work. And I'm always shocked at how piss poor some of the carriers are with their enrollment departments. Like, huh, I kind of thought you were a sales organization and wanted business. Yeah. I guess the, not. Yeah. The, you would think you'd do anything you can to make sure these submitted sales actually turn into real policies. Yep, yeah, so we've seen. What else do we have, Mike? Um, so eligibility, part A, part B. Um, dates wrong, eligibility levels wrong. Oh, incarceration. I saw that on our report this yeah. week. Um, sorry, you're incarcerated. You don't qualify for this plan. Um, a lot of weird ones. Even, even like missed addresses and stuff yeah. like that, you know, but almost always it's a med it's an eligibility thing. It's a Medicaid one. And then everything else is that accounts for about 50% of them. And then everything else is something else, you know, mm -hmm. on RFIs, we can talk about rejected apps as well, uh, at the end, but back to the, the data breach, it is significant. I don't know if you can think of a time in the industry where we faced something like this. Of course, tech hasn't really been at scale like it is now, but I don't think there's been a universally affect all carriers. It just goes to show you how how much adoption that system had across all of these insurance carriers. All of their enrollment departments were obviously using it. All of these uh, pharmacists were using it. And so it just kind of is a little bit scary about how how much is reliant on one single SaaS software, one single system. And the interesting thing for me is this is putting on my tinfoil hat for just a minute. Uh, I should have brought. I should have. I need to have a tinfoil hat that I, hey, I put I, on. I told two staff members this week I'll make them a hat, and they told and they said they'd proudly wear it. Just, I would proud. So I would proudly put my tinfoil hat on right now as I'm about to say this. But this breach happened right around that same time. I think it was the same day as the AT&T outage too, right? And there was also a, a hobby balloon, like one of those balloons floating across uh, Utah, our home state, all in the same 48-hour stretch. And so, you know, they're blaming it. They don't know if it's a Russia hack or, or something, but Dan and I have been calling this out for a long time, and we've been saying that this year is going to 
going to be crazy with election and it's going to affect uh it's uh -huh. going to affect some of these systems and we're all we're already seeing it so it was like the 22nd or the 20 so it was like 10 days ago or yep. nine days ago is when this uh when the when the outage happened and, and the solar and systems flare. are not it was so, the solar flare right yeah so cell phone providers it happened like two in the morning and so what's interesting is it did not affect t-mobile but it affected all the other carriers. They and they have so. they have really good anti solar flare technology. They have like yeah. T Mobile has solar flare shields exactly. across the US that that block that. Apparently. But so everybody else got hacked as far as the cell providers, but they were all back up and running like very, very quickly. It was a blip. But as far as the change health, do do we know are they back online yet? No. This, they're still not. And that's the other thing that, you know, obviously they're calling it a data breach, but it had to have done either they had to know that there was significant weaknesses in the system that could be further exploited. They've essentially shut down. And, you know, first thing when those things happen, you know, we could have our tech nerds talk about this, but you've got to, uh, you've got to stop the ability to access that data, you know? And if you think about that, the data that they're able to get through that, it's everybody's People filling prescriptions. Yeah. Prescriptions, uh, MBIs, insurance, MBIs, their yep. insurance thing. So, well, and, there, and there's a whole other scarier part of that too, is let's just say, well, you didn't get their social security number, but it's like, um, there's this whole thing with data enriching too. So it's so scary if you actually dig in with people who are, you know, tech nerds, the gurus. And when you get like one little kind of breadcrumb almost, or piece of information that you can then go to another source and match with another piece of information and we, we call it like data enrichment. And I mean, obviously we do yeah. it when we market, like, right. So for marketing, we'll get, you know, somewhat of a, that's why I think like the whole, even Apple privacy and, you know, I mean, it's all virtuous. It's all virtue signaling. Like, oh, this is so great. They're protecting my data. It doesn't matter. Like, I mean, people might dispute this a little bit, but I'm pretty real with the fact that they're going to get one little piece of information, go to nine other sources enrich it, make it better. And then they're going to have a whole profile of everything that they want to know, including your passwords to different websites and, you know, your friend that your on the street, your search histories, the street that yeah. you grew up on, you know, and as your password hint and everything, they'll know it all. So it's like, whatever. Yeah. It's, so it, it is interesting, you know, and of course there's a, a tendency. It's always Russia, right? Like Russia hackers and stuff, but we do know that there is a lot of, I think they're too busy killing Ukrainians at the yeah. moment. At the there, moment. There's a, uh, you, you never know, but like the Russia is like, I feel like just like the movies in the eighties, it's still this big nameless, uh, you know, USSR entity where we just blame Russia for everything. And, but if you think about it, we do know that there's a lot of Medicare fraud and Medicaid fraud that comes out. And if you have access to all those MBIs, I mean, you could, we hear about it all the time that people are changing people's plans and they don't know that they're changing plans. Um, you know, there's all this monitoring. It's it's essentially like having your your personal information, your credit your credit score uh, stolen or something like that. But essentially, it looks like everybody's personal healthcare information kind of uh, kind of was exposed. So I I think they're working on shutting it down, stopping access. But no, the systems are not up yet, and uh, and creating better security measures moving forward so that there's not they call it like vulnerability and penetration reporting yeah right? so, so yeah they've they've kind of been taken back um you know to not being able to verify it like they they were the past few years so we've had carriers say hey call this special hotline and you can talk to a, a person on the on the line and they'll verify up to 10 you know eligibility numbers and stuff like that but this is so it just adds an extra layer of complexity, an extra thing for the agent to do. And where a lot of these D-SNPs are already pretty complicated and, and convoluted, it adds a, a pretty significant step on those. It, it, it kind of reminds me back in the day before we had a lot of the systems that we have now, we made friends at a couple of the insurance companies. I'm not going to name who it was or which carriers or anything else. Okay, sorry. I'm not going to oust like, you know, like a journalist. I'm not going to give up my sources. But we had a couple people working at carriers that we made friends with. And then we actually were able to add them to our Slack channel. And then we would, you know, kind of message them and ping them and they would help us with eligibility lookups. So we didn't have to call into the hotline and wait 30 minutes and get shuffled around to an idiot. And so, or, or excuse me, a brand new person that just got done a training that didn't know anything. And so we actually had like our own secret messaging Slack channel going back and forth with some carriers. 
Yeah, it was we're, great. We're yeah. always we've always been playing 3D chess when other people are playing checkers. Yeah, so, so maybe yeah. maybe we need to go back to that and set up our you know our our internal. You yeah, know, but for right now, life. there it is not back up online. I'm hearing there's still people that are not able to pick up prescriptions because they're not able to have it billed. The eligibility is not up, and so I think that's important for agents to keep in mind, though, that they need to know what's happening so that they can educate their consumers, their members when they're calling. It doesn't necessarily mean that the insurance company sucks or that yeah. their plan sucks or there's anything else. It's not, and it's not just them. So if I'm a broker in the marketplace right now, I'm educating my consumer and I'm spending more time to say, hey, here's what's going on. Here's what's happening. It's not just affecting your particular insurance company. If you're mad with them and you want to change to another carrier because you're having a bad experience, it's same, same right now. So let's just get through this. This is going to be a thing. If, if we still have this issue in a month, or two months, let's revisit this, but this is just a temporary period of time. And candidly, it's not really just on the carrier. It's Yeah. Like, so so there is some manual verification that you can do right now for eligibility. If your dual client can find their award letter, it'll usually say what they're on. But that's like they're super finding organized. a needle in a haystack usually, <laughs> yeah. you know. They don't even know. The only, the only thing we ever used to be able to do here in Utah was be like, do you have the little purple card? Is that it you, purple or is it peach? Yeah, what color is it? That you hand uh, the doctor and, and then they go try to find their purple paper card. Then you knew you were golden, you know, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, there's, so you can call and verify. There is a little extra legwork um, on these dual plans that are like a fully qualified or a less, you know, Dan was talking about Quimby's and versus Slimby's that stands for qualified Medicaid beneficiary versus specified, low, limited, limited mm -hmm. qualified beneficiary. Those are, and usually plans, they will add richer benefits to the fuller levels, like the fully integrated duels or the fully duels. When in doubt, I've always wrote the less, you know, rich. The, the less rich benefits because I knew it wouldn't get rejected. And so, you know, of course, everybody always wants to give them the Opposite. extra thousand dollars worth of dental or whatever. But I'm like, you know, when in doubt, at least for now, let's let's go with the uh, the one that we know the plan's going to get accepted. Yes, I would urge you to the same thing. It's more like, hey, you might qualify for this higher level of benefit. Let's put you on this plan. And then, hey, let's wait if we can verify. And if you qualify for this one, we can always put you on that plan. We can upgrade your benefits. There you yeah. go. That's a classic e-tele broker call script yeah. right there We're for just you. calling to upgrade your benefits. Nothing's going to change in your plan. We're just upgrading your benefits. Nope, sure. Nope, nothing changes on your plan. Nothing's yeah. going to change at all. Mm -hmm. Except everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Except everything. Yeah. Exactly. So the, the other thing that we have going on this week um, is uh, NABIB, the, the conference back in Washington, D.C. Oh, hold up. Before we go to there, let's talk to you about there's one other thing that people should know about before we go talk about Capcom. Kay. And that is the, it's just, a, it's a headline right now. There's not a lot of steam yet. There's not a lot of details coming out from it yet. But the DOJ has started to investigate um, United Health Group and Optum um, with some of their acquisitions. Coincidentally, when did this drop? Uh, it is interesting, right, that this happened simultaneously after this hack, that now they're kind of going, oh, my gosh. Wait, the whole industry is related on, relies on this one thing? Yeah. yeah, there's a hack going on, and it is affecting things incrementally across the whole country. Oh, yeah, so there is that kind of correlation along with it. So now... You know, we talk about vertical integration, and we've mentioned it on this podcast many times, too, and what that is, and buying all these other components and pieces to the healthcare system. And, you know, definitely the most vertically integrated companies right now are United Healthcare, followed by CVS Aetna, yep. and then right behind there, Humana and others. But it's very much a trend in the industry. Um, it makes sense to kind of internally kind of build and own and create all those different components. It makes a lot of sense for... Um, efficiency for pricing for just a lot of reasons, but nonetheless, to it's, take money from your left hand and put, put it in your right hand. Yeah, hey, if yeah. somebody's got to make a dollar on the services you need, it might as well be yourself. You right? might as well make both of those dollars. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, it it makes sense. But now the DOJ is getting involved. There's going to be an investigation. Don't know yet, but we'll keep keep you posted on the result. And one of the biggest concerns that they have, at least that they're saying that they're investigating, is that they, of course, the DOJ, and I'm like. Why are you just now investigating this then? How come now? Because this has been happening for years where an insurer, you know, or a payer, however you want to phrase it, payer, insurer, actually starts buying the doctors, the clinics, the hospitals rendering the service, right? So they're saying, well, hey, hold on a minute. 
it doesn't make a lot of sense if you're the insurance company and you're kind of writing and writing your SOB, your summary of benefits and your evidence of coverage, like what you'll actually cover and what those things are. But then you're also owning the doctor or the clinic or the hospital where people are accessing care. Wait a minute. You can kind of favorably change some of the care treatment options, um, you know, to benefit you rather than the patient care. So that's the premise of the DOJ investigation. Yeah, it's yeah. it's interesting. I, I would like to look into the timing and see if that was a, a trigger, you know, but either way, it's a theme and it kind of parlays into what we're talking about next, which is sometimes I give, I don't know why I do, but sometimes I give the government a lot more credit than they obviously deserve about knowing what's going on in these industries, especially things like healthcare, where they're actually setting all the regulations and standards. And it's like, hold on a second. You didn't know that, what is UHC, the United Health Group, the third largest company in the in the entire country? It's number two, two or three on the yeah, Fortune 500. You didn't know that they're a behemoth? You didn't know that they own all of these uh, different downline acquisitions? You Clinics? And you don't know that a lot of the external distribution is getting rolled up? You know, you don't know that, that what... Apparently, you have to do a whole inquiry to figure out, and this is what we'll talk about next, what FMOs and Medicare brokers even do. Their like role. Like what, what with, their role is. Yeah, with the consumer and the healthcare cycle. Yeah. Yeah, but, it, you know, ultimately, it's just, you know, you think about it, you've got these politicians, and each one of them probably, you know, you have a certain skill set that each one is aware of, and there's actually not a lot of deep industry knowledge or expertise in a lot of these different industries, you know, you watch some of these different hearings and uh, industry experts have to kind of come before and, and, and give an accounting of what they're doing. But yeah, there's, there's a lot of, obviously a lot of gray um, that these, these uh, and latitude that these companies are able to operate in that the government actually doesn't really know how the, how the sausage is made themselves. Yeah, correct. So we'll, we'll see how this um, keep you posted on the DOJ investigation. Um, I always am okay putting out my my prediction of what I think is going to happen. And like I always say, let's let's check back in a year or two and see if they age well. But of course, my prediction is going to be that they 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 grandstand, they hold an investigation, and that they issue some kind of a fine or something to United Healthcare, and it's a slap on the wrist, and they pay a you know a, a three hundred million dollar fine, and they're like, well. There goes some of our profits for for a couple of days. Yeah, here you go. Here's, um, or, or they'll have to divest a certain piece of business. That I would has be like a sacrificial sacrificial yeah. cow that they they won't really even the, care they, about. There might yeah. be some compromise that they do there, yeah. like to just kind of save face. But I I really don't think that much just is going to result from the DOJ investigation. If anything, because of all the turmoil that happened with the hack and everything else, I think more than anything, it brought so much attention to it that they had to do something to, again, grandstand and save face. That's, yeah. that's my very real world take on it. That's not like a position of carriers or gut. That's just Dan's opinion on, I think what's going to happen. Um, so I don't think much is going to happen, but I, I will say next week we'll probably have um, Heather on our podcast. You know, we've, we, we've avoided having compliance on the podcast just because compliance is Because we not, want people to listen <laughs> and, not hurry, and not hurry and like... Because compliance is like not the most exciting thing out there in the world, especially for people in sales. It is just like a trigger word that just gets people like... They'll be like, oh, compliance, yeah. skip this episode. You don't know? Want, but it's, it's kind of becoming more and more and more important. And this whole week... Um, you know, Heather, our compliance officer, she was at Capcom this week in Washington. And she's been texting me back and forth a little bit, just kind of um, meetings they've been having. She obviously is me meeting with people in the Ways and Means Committee. She's meeting with different politicians, with their staffers. And what she found what was shocking is she said, hey, you know, some of these groups that I'm in, when you're meeting with different staffers and they're asking questions and you're giving input, um, none of the people in my group even did Medicare. None of them. She was just saying there was multiple times where – I'm with brokers and they're health brokers and they're maybe doing ACA or they're doing commercial, but they don't even do Medicare. So here's our policymakers who are trying to figure out what's going on and they're going to go vote. And candidly, the way that most, you know, it might even be one of those things where we'll probably have some people here in the, the state Senate or other people come on, you know, on the podcast to explain how 
these things are done and written, but usually... How? Um, a bill? What's so, that? Like, yeah, someone writes a bill. From the 80s or 90s. How, Mr. Bill? Exactly. When the bill becomes a law, you know? Like and it has, but, but usually what happens is most bills die in committee. Like yeah. they never even actually make it um, to vote because what happens is as it's written, by the time it goes to committee, it gets modified so many different times that by the time it comes out of committee, it doesn't even look anything like it did. And candidly, the person who's voting on it doesn't even really understand what it is to be candid because it's a thousand pages long and their staffers only had time to read through even half of it and then give them like the cliff notes version of it. And so yeah. that's what's truly going on in healthcare. And then they have to pull and decide how it lands with their constituents and then they decide how yeah, they're going to Yeah, and they go, wait a minute, it. if I vote yes or no, like do I benefit or win from this? Yeah. And how am I going to be perceived? Um, is this going to help my reelection or not? You know, and so I think there's a lot of that that's... so. Anyways, that's kind of going on right now in Washington. And I think this is a year that's safe to say um, election years are always very different from other years. Um, just fr from a marketing perspective and how you're going to advertise. And we've talked about it maybe quickly on the podcast before. But let's say I want to run a radio ad or I want to do a TV commercial or I want to do a direct mail piece. Everything is more expensive. Everything is significantly more expensive because why? Because all the airtime for all the ads, we, we learned a yeah. what was a $200,000 lesson with our first foray into serious ads during the campaign season for OEP. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Whew. It was, you know, that's nothing because super PAC money. Lit man. some money on fire. We, we, uh, oh, yeah. yeah. It, it's just like the RNC, the DNC, their, you know, their super PACs and the money that they have. And they will, they, they bid up and they, it doesn't matter the price tag. They're buying every TV spot they have. When you when you flip through Facebook, you know, we all hate it. Now I see more ads than I actually see content from my actual friends on Facebook. But they have to have only so many spaces as you're scrolling through, and they just will buy up all those ads. So, I mean, it very much affects things from a marketing perspective, especially if we have brokers in, you know, obviously swing states. Those ones we identify as, oh, my gosh, those swing states get hammered and it is so hard to run an effective marketing campaign um, during election cycles which is why if you're listening and you're in there good old and, grassroots and and there's a whole different set of rules and marketing and yeah. tcpa and regulations and compliance for government and election related things than there are for actual yes. you know average joe business owners like yeah. us we have to play by the rules and they have all these carve outs and all these exemptions and oh well, no we can spam if it's about so we we learned a lesson like years ago yeah. when we were running our um, social ads and to go ahead and take this for what it's worth all of you here's a free lesson in marketing we had a link on one of our ads to medicare.gov and we referenced the .gov link so facebook's stupid algorithm flagged that as like oh your company is doing political ads pause halt shut us down for a little while. We had to go through a whole verification process and then had to get a human on the phone. And it really disrupted marketing for about 60 days before we could get back up to speed and, and fix it. So don't ever reference a .gov link anywhere in your social stuff or else the algorithms will get you. Actually, if I the way I remember it, we didn't reference the .gov. It was that we need, we had, we didn't have the, on the website reference because it was some sort of governmental uh, product or back product, we had to have a bunch of disclaimers that we didn't know about mm -hmm. on the body of our website that no one ever, you know, of course we didn't know that no one ever told us that there's no playbook, mm -hmm. but yeah, I mean, it was almost like, why don't you guess about why the problem is and why these ads aren't being approved until you guess right, mm -hmm. you know? And well, it's just like paying taxes. Yeah. You just have to guess. It's like that meme, get, guess how much you owe. <laughs> okay mm -hmm. and the, what's what do i what happens if i guess wrong jail you know <laughs> <laughs> it's true so yeah that's that's going to impact things um from the marketing perspective but as mike and i we've been talking to kind of kicking up not to sound like you know conspiracy theorists but it just seems like every election cycle now things get more tumultuous divided heated and just more and more is at stake and at risk and so it gets this whole new incremental level, and I just think there's going to be a lot of, I think this, what we're talking about, it wouldn't shock me if there's more disruption between now and November with just different systems, hacks. Um, the other thing you have to be aware of, too, is it's kind of like a little bit of a 
holding pattern for a lot of politicians too in election years. They're always like we're we're talking about things from a policy perspective in the industry. You know, one big thing this last these last couple of years have been some of the medications that were approved. What's the one medication that was like crazy expensive? Agilheim. Been, yeah, it's been skewing everybody's bid. It was the it was the Alzheimer medication yes. that was actually proven to do nothing, but it was like so eight hundred billion or something. Exactly, like, like some jacked up crazy. everything. Well, so whenever we want to make changes to let's say Medicare or ACA or anything like that. And we want to bring it to the table and politicians are going to have to vote to significantly impact or change anything. They always have to, as Mike was alluding to kind of read the room and go, well, hold on, regardless of what's the right or wrong things, is this going to be a win for me or is this going to be like a negative? And so there's always kind of that gamemanship that's happening as well, especially like on an election year, like right now. So yeah, so we have, like Dan said, Heather is is back there. It's um, sponsored, put on by NABIB, right? Which is our our the name sucks. Lo- yeah, for them listening, they should change your acronym name. It's used bad. to be Nahu, which was not great, but it was way better than NABIP. It's actually NA, yeah, N A B I P. Um, I can still never even. It's been two years now since they changed it, and I still can't remember what the actual. Uh, acronym stands for but national association of benefits insurance, insurance providers, providers or something, something. Yeah. yeah well it, it's interesting because there's a document circulating where everybody that's back there at this convention you know it is in dc they're meeting with the house ways and means committee they've been uh meeting and interfacing with senator wyden's office and like dan said they're meeting with these staffers and talking about basically how the insurance industry works and it's a really good example of how the left hand has no idea what the right hand's doing you know because it's like cms obviously has a, a an insane amount of rules and regulations that we as brokers and fmos have to follow and yet the other side of the house the other hand on the, on the government is like well what do you guys do and what what are you responsible for we think we want to eliminate you you know it's so they've they've been circulating this document. Well, in their mind, they think, "Hey, why why don't we just cut out the middleman? Let's just cut out the middleman. Correct. That makes sense." Like we see it in business all the time, <clears throat> and I understand the premise of it, but it like we've talked about, it, it makes no actual pragmatic sense in the fact that if they do it, they just create a vacuum and then have to stand up something else, you know, that's just going to yield the same result or worse. Probably. Yeah. yeah. So so there's a. NABIB made a document and they've been handing it out to all of these, uh, you know, government entities and agencies. And it's like, here's what we do. You know, here's the services that we provide. And I'm like, huh, who would have even thought that we had to, that the government doesn't even understand our existence and what we, what we do and what we provide. And I mean, even from a pretty self-explanatory way, I, you know, if you didn't know what an insurance agent would do, I would assume that you would know that person is licensed. They had to study to get licensed with the state and they know, you know, about these financial slash health or maybe a PNC product and that they have to operate by a set of fiduciary duties and standards and that they are delivering a complicated product to a market and also performing a lot of a level of customer service for their compensation, you know? And so it was interesting, this document that's going around it's basically like breaks it down step by step like what here's exactly what it is that we do as insurance insurance agents yeah exactly you know to that point too one of the things that's i i I hate talking about compliance and it's not very exciting by the way I, i like talking about fun things like sales revenue strategy things that are very exciting this stuff is not but um, it's important. And going back to even some of the regulation right now with the different carriers we're talking about, what they don't know, and regulation is, um, and what we do as FMOs, like one of the things that we go through pretty regularly too is an audit process, an FDR annual audits. And they're pretty rigorous, I'll be honest with you. It's usually like a compliance investigator from a company will reach out. Here's this whole document. Here's everything we have to go through. You know, they review our standard operating procedures, our PMPs, our code of conduct, all, all these things. We have this background rig- checks for our employees. Yeah, do you screen everybody against OIG? And do you screen them against SAM? Do you, you know, that's the system of award management with the government and the Office of Inspector General. Do you screen all of your employees, your new agents against this? Um, do you make sure that everybody does, you know, fraud, waste, and abuse training, HIPAA compliance, 
all this stuff. So we have this very intense screening we go through as an FMO. And then there's carriers that we do business with that are smaller. And I'm not going to oust any of them. But we get a contract with them and we're like, hey, where's, like, do we have to go through our audit? And they're like, oh, no, you're good. Just sign this contract. Like, okay, there's no, uh, there's no audit here. There's no, you guys don't want to check, like, our data department or, like, our security measures or you don't want to check any of this. No, just sign this contract. You're good. Here's your dollar amount. Like, okay. You know, and it's interesting because gid- giddy up, like Kramer would say, you yeah. know, let's go. But um, it's just interesting because a lot of these carriers are the ones that are kind of, cry and foul about the bigger carriers. But then I think about when I have to go through like my human or my well care audit and it's like, they might as well get out the prod and just like, just it's wild. So it's kind of interesting talking about the state of all this and what do FMOs do and all these things. We have to hit like this litmus test of all these things that we have to, as a entity spend money and do and employ and implement in order to even be that FMO, that mid tier entity to facilitate all these things for CMS, for these payers and for these agents, there's actually a lot that goes into it. Yeah. And there there definitely is a a mass discrepancy, right? Because we'll find carriers to Dan's point that have given our same contract level to a a pretty fly by night operation, a guy that's a solo producer and a couple other producers, you know, they don't have any policies and procedures. They don't have an office. They don't have a compliance officer, you know, but they're getting compensated the same administration override. And so who knows, there may be some Some level setting of the rules there, which I think would just benefit us, you know? Um, But I think it'll actually really harm the smaller carriers, but they, they are the ones that have been kind of crying foul for some of this regulation to happen. And I think at the end of the day, people are kind of always surprised at the other end of regulation that it didn't turn out like they thought, you know, and it's not going to help them. Yep. Absolutely. Well, do we want to wrap up by... Well, let's go uh, election codes. We want to... We yeah, that's to talk. what... Before we wrap, um, just kind of, the, this kind of the time of year and the state of the union that it is, we're, we're most of the way through OEP, for those who don't know, the open enrollment period, you know, reinstated, brought back during the Trump administration, during the Obama years, it went away, brought it back. So now we have this period from January 1st through March 31st where you have that election code and the premise or the thought behind it, just so everybody knows is that in everybody knows the time of year to change your Medicare plan is the annual election period, AEP from October 15th to December 7th. You can pre-sell October 1st to October 14th, that kind of pre warm the market present, but you submit your applications October 15th through December 7th. But what happens is that sometimes, you know, plans don't work out like, Maybe they thought, maybe the doctor's not network. Maybe you're having issues with your particular plan. They wanted to give, you know, and, and that those plans that someone selects during AEP, they always begin on January 1st. And what happens is people don't always access care and start using their health insurance plan the very first week in January. They actually start using it maybe in February or March when they have their doctor visits or X or Y or Z. So they wanted to provide this window where people could change their Medicare Advantage plan if it, if it wasn't exactly what they were looking for or hope that it was, kind of give them a, whoops, a I screwed redo, up. Yeah. Let, me, let me change my plan to something appropriate. So that's really the intention of the open enrollment period. Um, so anybody who has a Medicare Advantage plan can change to another Medicare Advantage plan during OEP. But what we actually see, we get rejected apps from some agents, is that they'll try to put people on like a supplement and a drug plan to a Medicare Advantage plan during OEP, and that election code won't work for that. So we see rejected apps there. Um, the other thing is, if you start looking at carriers, a lot of them will hand out like a handbook. United Healthcare and Humana both have them, but there's like a hierarchy of election codes. Because if you actually start digging in, I'm a, I'm a nerd. I, I digest. I look at every single election code. Used to. I don't. I don't write business anymore. I kind of miss it. But anyways, you'd have all these different election codes, but they'd tell you, hey, and sometimes. You could go three or four ways. You're like, hmm, do I use like SPAP? Do I use OCC? Do I use IEP? Do I use, which, which one do I use? It's annual enrollment now. And which so, ones? Yeah. And so they'll kind of tell you like, here's your list of, if they qualify for this one, use this one first, then this one, then this one. So if you're listening, you should definitely get a copy of like either United Healthcare Humana's their um, election code handbook, study it, walk through it, learn it, know it. Um, but the reason I say that is, 
the more proficient you are as an agent and a broker and you understand what election codes are out there, you will be shocked. There's probably going to be 30 election codes you've never even heard of out there that you can use to your and your members' benefit to put them on a plan change or some type of a, an opportunity to change their coverage throughout the year if you know how these special election codes work. So that's um, – what do you want to add to that, Mike? As well, far as well I mean, you know, it's a catch-22. It's, it's basically – we joke that the election periods are enforced like our border and it's like no one really cares. Just get them. Just, you got to find the right pass to get them into like, Oh, nope, you chose the wrong one. You got to choose this other one and then we'll they're, approve they're it. Like, you know? you got to swim across the river yeah. instead of doing that. I and can't. Like, oh, okay. Yeah. You, you gotta, you gotta follow the rules, you know, jump, jump through the hoop, but do it this way, not that way. So what we're seeing is, you know, there are so many valid election periods now, valid election periods that you can write business year round. You know, we're, I think even we're going to write more business this open enrollment period than we did during annual enrollment we, period. Fun fact, we as an organization write more business, I think, oh, it's not even a question between OEP and lock-in significantly more than we do during AEP. And I actually think our OEP production is Almost, it's really close to our AEP production. Um, it's actually getting very close. So I would actually say when I look group together, the January through March and then April through whatever, Humana loves to call it Roy. I don't know why they call it rest, rest of year. Rest of year. They're like the only carrier that calls it Roy. Everybody else calls it lock-in. But we always just say there's always business out there. And the beautiful thing is everybody decides during AEP that they're going to get off their butt and they're going to stop doing freelancing or working. They're going to do whatever they were doing throughout the year. They're suddenly going to become Medicare agents only during the annual election period. And then they're going to go back to whatever they were doing. So in AEP, you always have very intensified competition, way more agents engaged trying to sell and compete. You have carriers for whatever reason. I, I don't know how I cannot, if you're listening and you work for a carrier, please help the cause. Stop thinking that you're going to write 60, 70% of your year's sales goal in AEP. It's not that way anymore. It's just not. But the carriers put all these budgets out there for AEP. The, the brokers all work during AEP. And then they go back to whatever they were leisurely doing throughout the rest of the year. And we always just find that if you're engaged and working, you're going to write a whole heck of a lot more business throughout OEP and lock-in than you are AEP. Yeah, so. uh, absolutely. The, the thing I wanted to talk about was we do, ha like I said, there, where there's a will in general, there's a way, right? Like I guarantee we're going to see another significant election period from this outage if we haven't, if they haven't already announced it, but there are actual disaster declarations and there, you can go to these carrier websites and they keep a list, mm -hmm. you know, the disaster, the DSTs, got a little bit out of control because they did have a a COVID disaster in 2020 mm -hmm. and that went away fairly quick, but then they just had a pretty much a catch-all. They changed it, the designation sometime in 2020, in 2020, Jeez. instead of it being a FEMA disaster, any county, state, or federally declared disaster does open or generate an, an, SEP. Ele an SEP for that county, state, or federal area. And so you can look right now, and there's disasters you, you never even heard about. There's the honey shortage in Tennessee, Grandma Sycamore's bread shortage, you know, and there's an election period. I mean, Mike's being facetious, but I'll be honest, like Utah, there's... So you have to understand, like, there these, these DST disaster codes that are legitimate, you can go look on FEMA's website, yeah. and a lot of the carriers have them, and they're very legitimate, so there's nothing fraudulent, nebulous, anything else as a broker, don't don't worry. You can go into your Jarvis United Healthcare portal and you can just download. They have a tracker of it right there. Um, Cigna sends out broker blasts about all the states where they have these DSTs. Um, so does Humana on Ignite. All these carriers are publishing you know, information out there telling you where the DSTs are. Like there's always like gas shortages like in the South, like, oh, um, we have a natural gas shortage. Um, so and cold, cold spell yeah, in Texas, it went below 50 degrees. Seriously. So there's a, yeah. there's an SEP. But no, know? when the governors declare, there's obviously motive for them to declare a disaster because there's some FEMA funding that's tied to it. Right. So whenever there's this a FEMA emergency, 
they get some federal funding. So, of course, these governors are very highly motivated to do that, and it's triggering all these election codes and these special SCPs. So just keep in mind, like I said, we, there's drought ones in Ute for drought. Like, how did this impact somebody shopping for their Medicare plan? It really didn't. But at the same time, there's an election code there to use. Um, say, like, they're all over the place. I would say right now I could probably go look, and there's about 30 out of the 50 states that probably have disasters. And some of them are statewide, some are county specific, but there's a lot of those. Um, the other thing we should probably mention are SPAP states like Maine, New York, Nevada, some of these SPAP um, opportunities. Stands for State Pharmaceutical Assistance Program. Plan. Yep, assistance plan. Um, and that's all these states like Dan's talking about that have some sort of state-based assistance for prescription drug help, which is a lot of them. And that generates a, an election period. The thought is you know, somebody may have a change or may need better insurance on these SPAPs plan, uh, SPAP plans, and it does generate so, a, a valid election period to change. So I'll, I'll talk about that, too. And I guess, you know, I'm, I'm okay keeping it real on this podcast and just being straight up because this is how it happens. In a lot of these states, you have a state pharmacy assistance plan that the state is running and administering, and they have like a carve out or a budget of funds you know, dedicated, like earmarked to subsidize or help people with their prescription drug, drug costs. And you have to fill out an application and apply for these state to get to get approved um, for state pharmacy assistance. Well, here's the problem. That state system doesn't really communicate with the federal system. Okay, so pretty much what you see in the industry a lot is the broker will go just the same day. They're like, oh, hey, Mike, do you know, do you qualify for state pharmacy assistance? Like, I don't know. What's that? You know, I don't know because I don't do it. I'm just the broker, but let's just, let's fill out this questionnaire and submit it for you. Um, and we'll see if you qualify. Can, no, no promises, no guarantees, but let's see. You have a $3 million house, but we'll, yeah, Mike, we'll, we'll put it in there and see what what's happens. What's your annual income? 362000 Yeah, I don't know if we're going to qualify, but let's just see what happens. And, and if you put the application through, the state system doesn't talk to the federal system and ta-da, election code, and the fact that you attempted to put somebody on, a, on an SPAP plan, there you go, there's your election code, and you can put somebody on an MAP plan. The same thing's applying on the ACA side of things right now, too, with uh, like loss of Medicaid status or denied Medicaid status. It's like, oh, I applied for Medicaid, and what Don't do you know? know? I, I made... Two hundred fifty thousand dollars. I did not qualify for Medicaid, but now I have a. But, well, and here's the thing: election the, period. Those, to, those determinations take time. Depending yeah. on the state, they take sometimes days, sometimes weeks, depending on the state. Some states listening out there, they're awesome. Like their insurance departments are awesome. Others freaking suck. They're so poorly ran, and so sometimes you're weeks or months waiting to hear back if you qualify. So what happens is, you know, enrollment in for a special election code just gets approved because of that waiting period for the determination. Yep. So, you know, so there's all those opportunities out there on SPAP. There's opportunities with um, obviously DST out there. Always going to be the people aging in, turning 65, people coming off of group coverage, loss of EGHP out there. There's also, um, of course, IEP2s, people with delayed enrollments. Um, GEP is coming up. I think most brokers I talk to don't even understand how GEP works. Yeah, I'll G be honest. Um, it's and then, pretty rare these days that someone needs to use it, but it still happens every it once in a while. Freaking happens. People yeah. don't want to get their premium and then they, you know, are late. So GEP is still out there and that's coming up, you know, in this, July. Usually. Right now is when you are supposed to be submitting people for the GEP in July. For you listening, now's your moment to have those people apply. 471 coverage on G we'll, we'll talk about it on another podcast but um gep is out there and then of course now um low income you know because lis and dual that election code is blacked out during fourth fourth quarter and now that we're into you know new year you can use that election code again so for all those duels and again keep in mind we have a lot of brokers we've heard from throughout the country who are somewhat Adverse, is that the right word uh, to say that they don't want to work with the, the, the dual, dual population. population? I really like working for the dual population, to be honest. Like, I think that's a demographic that needs your help, that feels rewarding to try to help, that it's a great, those people really do need your help. And there's a lot of resources going in there. And 
the FPL level, the federal poverty limit, and people qualifying for those keeps moving higher and higher and higher. So there's more eligibles that, that qualify for those every year too. So yeah, if you're if you're doing Medicare and you're passing up on duals, I mean, you're in some states you're passing up on literally fifty percent of the market. You know, there's uh, quite a few states where the federal poverty limits that fifty percent or more threshold. Yeah. You know, or like states like New Mexico, where f- more than 50% of the seniors qualify for a, d- a DSNP. So if you're, you know, if you're turning your nose up at that business because you don't want to serve that population, you're, you're missing out on a significant it's, portion. I, I use the, you know, the illustration or the comparison. It's no different than being a real estate agent and someone's like, hey, I want to sell my house that's $900,000. Can you help me? You're like, oh, no, I'm sorry. I only work with houses that are $5 million or more. Good luck. I'm not your guy. It's like... Why would you turn that down? Like, that is just absolutely crazy. Well, you know, they're difficult to deal with. Yeah, I kind of want to make that commission, you know. Yeah, I mean, it, it still is a less sticky demographic. Like, the, the, the stick rate on those is definitely less than traditional MA. But it's better than it was when we first got in the industry. I 100%. mean, you, you used to be able to change a dual person every month. And you just had door knockers going through these low-income communities that were switching people's plans every single month and your average retention you know was like six months or less it's certainly better than that is now yep. um so it's a it's a significant population and then well and the case managers are getting involved and the carriers who are not in that business are now jumping into that business and they're putting significant resources into the management and the case management of those complex needs of those duels yeah and you know a lot of carriers pay a really good dual HRA that pays significant, you know, a lot of money and there's no chargebacks on some those of them HRAs. as high as 175, 225 per HRA and they don't charge you back. So even if you write a dual and it falls off the books in two months, they do not charge you back your HRA. Like there's a very good hint for you all listening. Yep. Yeah, we're talking about HRAs with an agent just today that writes hundreds of policies God. and apparently doesn't do any of them. I'm not, like, you, you literally must hate $20,000 for, we for actually, 20 minutes worth of work. This conversation occurred earlier yeah. today, yep. literally with an agent where we said, huh, I just did some rough napkin math for you, and I guess you didn't want that $20,000 this year. Yeah, so the, the, uh, the point I wanted to make with all of the election periods was we're seeing a higher amount of rejected apps than we should. And it's mostly because of two things. Either an agent is using, they're an un, they're a newer agent and they don't quite grasp OEP and they're just using that like it's an AEP and they're using that election period catch-all. as a catch-all, mm-hmm. which it is not. You have to use a different one like an SPAP or a loss of employer group coverage or a... OCC, uh, other credit yeah, coverage. Or, yeah, or a... Um, the the low income subsidy, if they qualify for that or loss or change of Medicaid status. But the point is, if you write a policy and you don't do it, you don't, you know, you just don't understand these election periods, that policy may never go back into effect. And it's hard to get a hold of people again. And you got to follow up and you, and they're expecting those policies to go live. And some agents are better than others at tracking those policies, but make sure that you're understanding those, uh, election periods and watching your RFIs and rejected apps. The other thing is, especially right now, while we're dealing with this uh, breach and the eligibility is low, you're you're probably going to have a little, a few more policies that need some extra TLC, need some follow-up to make sure that you wrote the right Medicaid status on those. Yeah. And I would say at large, the e-tele brokers and the telesales shops are the ones who are using these tools like big, big, big time. I mean, I would still say like the the traditional kind of in the field, in the market, meet at the kitchen table type of agents are not quite as impacted by this because I, from what I've observed, they've always been the not relying on the tech for it. They've always been the people who are calling into the different carriers to verify. And so they're not going to be as impacted by this. They're somewhat, somewhat insulated. Um, they're just kind of being like, oh, well, Usually I look in my human advantage and it's not working. I guess I'm calling in, but yep. they're, they're finding a workaround, but it's definitely impacting more the, the e like telebrokers for sure. A- absolutely. Yep. Well, I, th- I think we're about, about wrapped. We ended up going a little bit longer than I think we anticipated. So, okay. Well, perfect. We'll catch you. So next week plan on 
Capcom and exciting compliance next week. And we will we will make it as interesting as possible. <laughs>